So hello everyone um, and welcome to this Cooperation Live um, online event. Uh, I'm Eva Murray, I'm the Campaigns Officer um, at the Cooperative Party um, and I'm really pleased to welcome you to this event uh, this evening um, on community energy. Uh, but before I introduce our wonderful speakers, um, I just want to kick off with a few tips on how we can make uh, this meeting as interactive uh, for everyone uh, to take part. Firstly, for those of you who may be hard of hearing, you can enable captioning by pressing CC icon on the bottom tools panel of your uh, phone or computer, and this has to be done uh, by yourself. Um, this Zoom call is being recorded. Many of our members cannot access it live, so we'll make it available to view via the Co-op Party's YouTube channel. So if you don't want your image to be seen, uh, remove yourself from the video and go to um, audio only. Um, and you've been muted to make the content of this call clear by preventing interruptions and any background noise. Um, only those speaking will have sound enabled. When it is your turn to speak, we will send you a message asking you uh, to unmute. After we have heard from today's speakers, we will hold a question and answer session. There are two ways you can ask a question, either number one, raise your virtual hand, um, or if you don't want to come on screen, uh, you can post it um, in, the, in the chat box and we'll get to as many questions um, as possible. And finally, just before we start, I want to emphasize that the Cooperative Party believes that our cooperative values should be reflected in our actions as well as our policies. We want all members um, and all our event participants to feel safe, welcome and respected in our party. So please ensure you abide by this when making your contributions today. Um, and I look forward to hearing, um, hearing them all. So just as a little introduction to tonight's um, event, uh, for too long, our energy has been produced and owned abroad enriching oligarchs and multinational oil and gas companies. Meanwhile, our bills have soared to record highs. There's never been a more important moment to invest in cheap, clean, renewable energy produced and owned right here in the UK to give all of us a greater stake and say in our energy system and to help reduce our bills. Community energy, where local communities own and profit from renewable energy projects in their local area, should be at the heart of this ambition and is already helping to power nearly 200,000 homes across the country with clean, green energy. And at the, corporate, the Cooperative Party, we believe community energy must be central to the transformative agenda for renewable energy. Um, and that kind of leads me on um, to what we are currently doing at the Cooperative Party. In, in these co-op lives, we want to ensure that there's an action afterwards. We often get um, questions from members and supporters after they've been inspired by what I've heard at co-op lives uh, from our speakers to say, what can they do next? So we've actually produced a campaign pack um, on community energy. Um, we've got one for, for members and we've one uh, for our elected members as well. And these include motions, advice on how to get local media involved, um, how to get your local elected members on board, um, draft letters to those elected members, and we also have a great local power locator tool, which currently works um, for, for any English uh, postcode where you can go online, put your postcode in um, and it'll tell you how many uh, how many community energy projects are in your local area. And it will also auto generate um, a letter to go to your local MP asking them to support the expansion and growth of, of community energy projects. If you already have some or if there's none saying what are they doing to ensure that uh, in the future, there there are there are community energy projects in the area, and again, that long term uh, funding, financial support for them. We also have a website uh, with uh, a lot of this for our campaign specifically. And um, again, it has different actions on it for how members can get involved, and um, different levels of uh, how how they can get involved as well. If you really want to take it all the way um, and, and look at a blueprint and how you can you can get get more involved in the local energy project in your area. Or if it is a start of you know signing one of our petitions, getting in contact with local, one of your local elected members, trying the the, the tool that I uh, mentioned there, then it's all on this website, and I will put that in the the chat too. Um, in addition, we're really keen to get out to, to branches and and local and local parties, and we've already done a number of, of sessions with office bearers um, in different parts of the country on on Zoom. Um, again, just going a bit more in depth about why this is such a priority for us as a cooperative party, and um, why we believe so uh, we believe we believe so much in community energy and, and the power it has it has to empower communities and, and make our um, society a better place. So if that is something you'd be interested in after this uh, meeting, um, again I'll put in the the chat and um, my email address and you can get in contact with myself as a campaigns officer and we can arrange something uh, for me to get out to, to one of your, uh, your your meetings or, or whatever it may be so um, enough from me on that like I say I'll put that into the chat so we can get in contact 
but um, enough uh, for me um, on that. I now like to introduce our, our wonderful speakers. And just before I begin, I know it was advertised that we'd have um, Afshin Kabir Rashid from, uh, who's a founder and CEO of Repowering. Um, unfortunately, um, Afshin at last minute has been unable to, to, to make it. She really does apologize. And we're really hopeful that we'll have her at one of our um, future meetings. So I know she was really keen to get here um, uh, today. Um, but our first speaker um, is Alistair McPherson. Um, Alistair is the Chief Executive at Plymouth Energy Community. Um, they have been empowering their community to create a fair, affordable, zero carbon energy system with local people at its heart. Uh, you know, key to tackling the crisis of today, including fuel poverty, cost of living um, and climate change, all whilst um, empowering local people. So over to you, Alistair. Thank you, Eva. Um, and yeah, hello, everybody. Um, it's a real pleasure to to be here this evening and um an, an honor to be invited um so yeah i am alistair mcpherson i am the chief executive um for plymouth energy community and i think my brief is to give you a whistle stop tour of um, what we're doing in plymouth um in relation to local energy and community energy and i hope to leave you with um the belief of what is possible um think if we're going to tackle the energy transition every area needs a Plymouth energy community and you know, we need to be doing this um, at a lot larger scale than we currently are so uh, but we've had some success in, in Plymouth and I'd like um, I'm excited to, to uh, have the opportunity to tell you a little bit about that so I've got a few slides um, I'm not going to go into a huge amount of detail but try and give you the breadth of, of what we're seeking to achieve and then clearly there's opportunities for questions afterwards so bear with me and I'll just bring up the slides. People seeing a logo. Brilliant. Okay, so that's us. Um, so we are, uh, yeah, where are we? Um, we're actually a family of, um, of organisations. We're a charity. We, we are three uh, or four social enterprises. Um, we have cooperative ethos is um, written throughout our kind of governance and protocols. We have three community benefit societies um, and a charity in, in, in that mix. And we've got a headline ambition there about a fair, a more, a more just, a more affordable um, zero carbon energy system with local people at its heart. Um, and that's what drives us on a day to day basis. Um, I'm not going to read that because it feels a bit trite if I just read my mission statement but you can read that but it is um, at the heart I think the second one I think is kind of key um, local increase local ownership confidence and influence over local energy solutions um, why local energy solutions we are at absolutely unprecedented time and opportunity to put local communities and stakeholders at the heart of restructuring our economy net zero transition provides an opportunity that won't ever come around again it probably hasn't been there before um something fundamentally has to change in in the way that our economy um and our operations act and in that change there's a number of ways that could happen um we believe putting local at the heart of some of that change um is key and um, we want to make the innovations and the investments that are required to make that change help um, actively reduce poverty and inequality and build in principles of social justice and equity into that to maximise social impact. That all sounds very grand, doesn't it? But um, in reality, it is doable. We've been doing that for the last 10 years in Plymouth. In practice, what does that mean for us in Plymouth? It means PEC operates in two broad spheres. It operates in a, a community asset, community wealth building sphere, where it is actively developing long term community owned assets um, that are there that support the net zero transition, hold um, you know those assets in perpetuity for the local community, take surpluses from the businesses that run off those assets and pour that back into other um, action around um, fuel poverty and climate. And the second side of what we do is fundamentally, this is a people problem as much as a technical problem. If we're going to put communities at the heart of it, we need people to be talking to people about that. So we do a lot of work and um, a large part of our team is like talking to residents, uh, businesses about that, that transition. We do a huge amount of work working in the community at a grassroots level, talking to people about the challenges they have with energy, the cost of living, 
um, supporting them in with the sort of very real challenges of that, the immediate challenges of balancing the household bu budget through to the more longer term kind of transitions of like um, retrofitting their homes. Um, but we're also holding and convening, I guess, the, the broader conversations that need to be have, um, that we need to be having in our communities around net zero and tackling fuel poverty by having more, I guess, creative ways of conversations that are less immediate and less right now, let's do this. But like, how do we engage broader conversations um, and broader groups of stakeholders in, in the um, conversation around energy transition? So that's broadly what we do. Um, where do we start? We started 10 years ago from some fairly blunt political ambition locally um, held by co-op co and um, Labour Group members in Plymouth that we wanted to, to see um, uh, tackle better the issues around affordable warmth and fuel poverty. There was high levels of funds frustrations with the big six power companies at that time. And there was like kind of like, what can we do? Well, you know, how can we um, tackle some of that kind of very poor service and frustration and lack of trust? There was um, particularly around the issues of so that those on some of the lowest incomes paying the most for their kind of energy retail through like prepayment meters and those things. They were real live issues at that time. And Plymouth, whilst it had lots of sunshine um, and um it wasn't actually, it was falling behind in terms of the level of uh, renewable energy deployed in the city. Um, uh, a Labour Council um, that came in at that time in 2012 had a manifesto commitment to tackle those kind of three things. Um, and out of that came an idea of creating community organisation, uh, a cooperative organisation called Plymouth Energy Community. So we were formed in 2013. Um, we operate in kind of those realms that I talked about earlier, those two kind of areas, community wealth building and um, and sort of advice and you know, community outreach. And I guess in the first few years of our activities, we, we made a name for ourselves by um, getting a lot of the city's school rooftops and community organisations and covered in solo so in two years we did 32 installations on community buildings across the city we raised and um, those two years about two million in community shares to fund um, that we partnered with the local authority to unlock the required leases for those buildings we use local installers to get those done and those um, rooftops now operate and you know, surpluses from those rooftop businesses go back into our fuel poverty work in 2016, um, we took an opportunity to work with uh, a local economic development trust in the north of the city um, uh, to bring a redundant piece of land um, into um, use as a um, solar farm. So we built a 4.1 megawatt solar farm. We financed that project, we developed that project and we built it out and completed in 2016 um, and raised another um, million or so in community shares to, to, to part finance that and raised other social finance to 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 manage the 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 rest um that kind of established us as an organization right we've got assets here that kind of last and be generating um, energy and generate revenues into our community for the next um um 25 30 years hopefully longer um and so we kind of um thought well Oh, sorry, I missed this one. Oh, we, we continued. 2016 was the last time we built one. Uh, this is our um, site that we hope to be um, kicking off this year. This is a 13 megawatt um, solar farm on a um, landfill site um, to, on the east of our city. Um, another redundant piece of land. Um, this would be the, the biggest solar farm in the, the well, I mean, nearest, I think the closest, yeah, within a 25 mile, 30 radius. Um, we're doing it as a 50-50 joint venture uh, with the council um, and uh, we are currently in the final stages of design should be on site in April to um, sort of break ground on that. Um, and we have a pipeline of other projects of like varying scales from two megawatts to another eight megawatt sites that we are currently developing. So we have, we've got work to do and we're having success in this space. That success led us to think about the other things that we could do in terms of like adding value as a you know, cooperative community-led organization. Um, we established a, um, a community-led housing organization to bring the innovation that we saw as being required to um, tackle the issues around net zero new build housing and, and making that affordable. And so for the, um, we are currently now 
in live conversations with um, to develop 70 affordable net zero homes um, in the northwest of our city, not very far from our solar farm. Um, and uh, we are partnering with another social housing association to, to do that. And we aim to fund that through a range of um, private um, debt and again, community shares raised through the Charitable Community Benefit Society we've um, formed to, to um, create this. We're trying to build homes using an innovative um, uh, construction technique and contracting technique that we've um, uh, learned from the Dutch Dutch partners called Energy Sprong, um, which would be the first of its type in the UK. So those are kind of two, two areas where we're actively, I guess, like developing in one form or um, another as a, a, as a local um, community developer. Um, at the heart of where we've been, we've always been about trying to to bring, you know, have conversation, the broader sense of the conversation. This isn't just about the innovations um, that we need to do. It is about tackling the current problems that we have and uh, some of the fundamental inequities we have within the current energy system. So those three bullet points are kind of feel really simple about, oh, yeah, right. Simple, isn't it? Tackle fuel poverty, maximise income, reduce the heat loss. Reduce energy consumption. That's a difficult thing to do. Um, 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 we have a, a team of about 12 energy advisors that are working um, uh, day in, day out, supporting people um, who are in crisis um, and or frustrated or in um, dire straits um, are associated with the challenges associated with paying their energy bills and then the spin-off problems that happen around that. So. We are supported with, I guess, by charitable organisations to provide that that support to households. But in, I guess as an indication of the scale of the problem, um, we are regularly in touch every year with about 6,000 households in a city of about 130,000 households. Um, so we did last year, um, we provided detailed casework, so ongoing casework for 1,600 households with 900 households receiving a kind of one-to-one energy advice visit in their home. So this is a, it's a problem at scale that we are maybe tackling at scale. Um, alongside um, that work that we do, I, I, we, I guess, which is framed in, I guess, the short term demands around like <laughs> energy inequality and fuel poverty, uh, we are developing um, a, a, a comprehensive package of support to households that allows them to understand um, the kind of retrofit options that they can take within their homes, um, allows them to get that an impartial view on that. I, we will provide a guidance to them about what is suitable to their home in terms of the kind of things that could be done to reduce consumption through improved heating or power systems and the, um, improved insulation. Um, and then we signpost them to two things grants that would be available to support their costs with that um, and crucially local installers um, that can help and um, have the right accreditations to do that work so we act as a intermediary with with no particular commercial acts to bear or product to sell to the household um, and to try and lock um, um, a situation where a lot of people are talking about the need to retrofit their homes and a lot of people being uh, your companies good companies trying to sell them stuff um, to help retrofit their homes but in the middle is a huge amount of confusion and mis, uh, misinformation sometimes and distrust and so we feel that organisations like us that can act as a local trusted broker around this will be key to unlocking retrofit um, in our wherever you are in, the, in this country. Um, that will be key. So that's fourth arm of what we do. It involves detailed kind of understanding of our, our city's households um, and understanding about where um, what kind of um, initiatives will be taken up by certain parts of the city, either in terms of like their 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 um, relative levels of income or the types of properties and the types of um, you know, measures that would go into those properties. All right. And yeah, it transforms the numbers of homes. So last year we did, um, uh, I think it was, we did 100 and 
63 homes received um, grants of, in the average of about 7,000 homes, um, the highest grant being somewhere just shy of 20,000 homes with like, in, you know, I guess like improvements to their homes, long-term improvements from external wall insulation, internal wall insulation, improved ventilation, um, PV systems and heat pumps. So at the heart of what we're trying to do is drive local impact um, and local benefit and using the opportunity the energy transition to, to, to set up an organisation that does things very differently. We think these local energy approaches are said are absolutely key. Um, we're really encouraged um, by what we're seeing in an election year and commitments coming forward from the core party and from Labour around their, their ambitions for local power and to really invest in this, this sector. It can be quite transformative. And in that context, I think it's important for people to understand that this stuff is possible. And what we've done in Plymouth the last 10 years proves that it's possible. The kind of numbers there in terms of the scale of impact we are having um, kind of tell that story. Um, we are now turning over um, 3 million, um, over 3 million a year. We have over 500 community investors. Um, we've raised, you know, repeatedly raised money, but, you know, we've raised over like a six, seven, million in terms of capital to invest into um, uh, various assets locally. We've got 27 community non-exec directors and trustees helping run this and keeping the community at heart of what we do. Um, and we've got a staff team of, of 31 staff that are paid well, they want to work for us. And, you know, we, you know, these aren't kind of like fly by night jobs. We are here for the long term. And every area will need someone like us. So um, if you have that influence in your local area, please do use the um, campaign information that either um, will be circulating later. That's me, I've overrun a bit, I'm sorry. Thanks very much for that, um, Alistair. Um, I think it's a perfect example of how you, you've been able to adapt to the needs of, of, of the city, um, also making these services and community energy um, accessible. But I think crucially just the the partnerships that you've been able to to create. And I've always been very interested in that one that you have with the local authority. And I think it could be a, um, you know, really as a great blueprint for how other places can do similar where, you know, kind of knocked back, you can say, well, well, Plymouth are doing it. So why can't, can't we? Um, and I'm sure we'll have more discussion about that in the, in the question and answer session. Um, our next uh, guest is, is Michaela Cryer. Uh, Michaela is a director of Unity, who've been doing a power of work to support the expansion um, of community energy and um, ensuring it succeeds. And as they say themselves, they won't rest until community energy Energy has earned its place at the heart of sustainable power. So Michaela, I'll invite you in to speak just to talk about um, how Unity came about and some of the work that you've been doing. Thank you. Um, thank you, Eva, and thank you, Alistair, for giving such a wonderful example of, yeah, they are the possible with community energy. Um, so as Eva mentioned, yep, yeah, I'm Michaela Cryer and I head up Unity. Um, so Unity, um, just for context, is a joint venture between Mid Counties Cooperative, who are the second largest independent cooperative in the UK, and Octopus Energy. Um, so before I talk about what we do and our support for the sector, I'll just give a bit of context of that because you might think that's a bit of a, you know, unusual partnership. But uh, Mid Counties Co-op, um, hopefully some of you are aware, they've got food, travel, childcare, um, and you know the heart of their ethos is very much a fairer, ethical, more sustainable future. And back in 2019, they had uh, a Co-op Energy energy business um, which looked after you know close to 200,000 residential customers back in 2019 it was decided to um, partner up with Octopus and transition that portfolio over to Octopus Energy um, so Co-op Energy still exists but it's part of you know the Octopus Energy family as well but when that transition happened given you know principle six co-ops like in with, working with other cooperatives and given that community energy groups are cooperatives or um, community benefit societies Rather than like kind of losing that relationship and cooperative, you know, ethics and values as part of the transition, it was decided to really create a focus in how can we support these, you know, essentially mini cooperatives, these small community energy groups or larger ones such, such as Plymouth, how can we really help them thrive? So um, Unity was born out of that. Um, 
And just just for context, so the the core part of what we do, and I feel very fortunate because we get to speak with groups up and down the country, um, and we currently work with one third of the community energy sector in the UK, um, something that we're very proud of. But principally, we buy the energy that is generated by these community owned wind, solar, hydro projects. Um, and we ring fence that energy and we put it into a co-op community power tariff. So that's the only tariff in the UK that's 100% powered by community energy. Uh, it's unfortunately not currently available to new customers because of the energy crisis, but hopefully in a few months that'll be available once again. But um, we buy the energy from these groups. And why that's important is because if you're a, a large asset, so if you're, you know, ha have a wind turbine or a large solar array in the field, you know, that's a lot of energy and a lot of suppliers would be, you know, very keen to purchase that energy. However, if you've put a bit of solar on a community center or the local school, you know, a lot of that should be used um, for on-site usage, which is the correct and most meaningful um, way of using the energy. But if there's any energy that needs to be exported, we will always buy that energy if it's community owned. Um, and that's important because it means these smaller projects and often, you know, as Alistair spoke about, Plymouth are, have got a lot of experience, a lot of staff, but these smaller groups are just starting off. A typical way a group would start off usually would be to look at the local school or the local community centre. So having that kind of outlet and financial viability by buying the energy that exported um, is, is, is part of the, how it kind of comes into fruition. Um, so and with the power purchase agreements, that's what they call PPAs, um, we work with now over 250 community projects. And just for context, um, you know, that, that encompasses a lot of wind, Hydro is very popular, but solar, as you would imagine, is, is, is the number one, um, and especially rooftop solar. And, and as mentioned, with the newer groups coming in um, and establishing community energy in the area, a rooftop solar tends to be the most popular method for that. And so within our portfolio, we look after over 100 schools that have community energy on their rooftops, which is wonderful because then, you know, the community, the school benefits because they don't have to pay um, any capital they don't have to you know put out immediate costs to install the solar but they're going to benefit from the solar it's community owned um, and why we care about community energy I know Eva and Alistair have obviously highlighted it wonderfully but a we all, we all know we need more renewables and we need them at speed they're the cheapest form of, of energy but also when it's community owned I think we probably all feel this a little bit it can be at the moment with the climate crisis and the news it, it can it can leave many people feeling very kind of disillusioned and helpless but I think community energy really gives that sense of empowerment taking action you can see it it's happening and it gives you that actual community of like-minded people um but what I absolutely love about it is the social impact so when energy is sold to people like us any surplus, you know, every local that has invested should get a return on investment. And then any surplus is put into a community benefit fund. Um, and as Alice mentioned, some of the activities that Plymouth do. Um, but we work with groups up and down the country. So we've got to see firsthand what that sort of social impact work can be. And it can be, you know, there's a lot of like climate action going on in, in local schools. It can be, you know, repairing London. Afshin was supposed to speak this evening, but she probably would have mentioned they've helped train over 150 young people. Um, and that's all through this, you know, community benefit fund. Another example is um, there's a wonderful group um, near Oxfordshire called West Mill Wind and West Mill Solar. And from their projects, they've been able to um, provide half a million in grant funding. They've been able to have 12,000 um, people visit the, the sites. And you can imagine if that was a privately owned asset, you just, sorry about the lighting in this room, by the way. Um, if it was a privately owned asset, the, those sort of social impact on the ground activities just, would, just wouldn't happen. So um, we kind of exist to really try and help the movement grow and help it thrive. Um, so as well as the power purchase agreements, we've also kind of listened to the sector, um, tried to understand well, what are the challenges, what do we need to help the sector grow? And obviously the, the local power plan that Labour and Co-op Party are proposing is absolutely wonderful and just what the sector needs. Um, and in terms of 
the local power plan talks about, you know, kind of early stage funding. That is a, a challenge that we've heard up and down the country that groups, yes, they could do the share raises and they could be successful, but they can take time. And in the interim, you still need to pay your deposits to pay for the solar panels or the wind turbines. So what do you do in that bit in the middle? Um, so we've launched um, something called Community Energy Kickstart. Um, and it's a 1.5 million loan facility that we lend out to community energy groups for that build out phase. So the idea is to have it for three, six months, um, help with the, build the project. They do their crowdfund share raise and then hopefully pay us back and we can help the next group. Um, so we recently lent a million to Bristol Energy Co-op. Um, they're a wonderful group in Bristol and they installed the largest um, community owned rooftop solar array in the country. Um, it's a one megawatt and it's also a good example of, you know, rooftop solar working with your local council. Um, it's on a film studio that's council owned. Um, and the other aspect of what we're trying to do is, and it's great that, you know, Labour and Co-op Party are um, such advocates for community energy because we find, you know, community energy is great if you know about it. Um, but pr prior to this role, I've worked in the energy sector, you know, for 15 years, and I only heard about community energy three years ago, which is really frustrating because I would have loved to have got involved in my 20s and I didn't have, you know, a family, etc. So it's just like, how do we kind of raise that profile? And so some of these projects, so I mentioned the Bristol Energy Co-op rooftop solar array, that's on a film studio. Um, and because it was on a film studio, that then entered a sustainability award at the Cannes Film Festival. So it's reaching a whole new audience of the power of community energy and the art of the possible. Um, so we've got the, the Kickstart loan. We also do grant funding. So we've distributed 50K so far in grant funding. Um, and that's been really great to see, again, the social impact, the grassroots work that the, the groups up and down the country do. So um, some of the, our groups that have um, taken advantage of the grant funding, for, for instance, have undertaken a youth summit in their area, focusing on climate action. Um, some have, you know, hired, wanted to pay for thermal imaging cameras to help with fuel poverty. Some have wanted to have drones to, you know, really showcase the work they're doing. Um, and the, the plethora of activity is absolutely fa fantastic. Um, and then lastly, we have you know, again, listening to groups, what are the challenges? How can we really grow the sector? And the number one theme that constantly occurs is time and capacity. Um, Alistair and Plymouth, you know, they're a wonderful group of, uh, an example of a group that, you know, has been able to pay employees and, you know, expand. But if you're just starting out and you haven't done your first project yet, and it, or you do one and it's small, you can't yet kind of reach that scale. So um, in, the community energy sector 70 percent is actually volunteer led so capacity is naturally a bottleneck so we have launched a platform called community energy connect and the idea is if a group needs certain help like pr financial planning engineering local engagement they can go on the platform and say what they need and then on the flip side, you know, when we speak to people and we try and raise awareness of community energy, a lot of people can say, oh, I love it, but how do I get involved? And it's great if you've got a Plymouth community energy group in your area, but if you happen to be in an area which actually doesn't have any community energy or you don't know where to start, um, we wanted to have like a bit of a, a core kind of take action hub. Um, so people, volunteers can go on there and say, I can do two hours a month or a week or whatever, and these are my skills. And the idea is people can come together and hopefully really help drive the movement forward. Um, and we've had a number of connections. Um, we've had about 130 people um, join up so far. So there's a lot of interest. It's just, yeah, we want to galvanise it and help community energy get, get to that next step. And from a national scale as well, I think we're seeing definitely a growth, um, as you can imagine, in rooftop solar, but we're also seeing this economies of scale. So we're actually seeing some really, really big projects now coming to fruition that, um, you know, are on like a commercial scale, but with that social benefit and impact. And just, I guess, a reminder of, you know, why, why should we care? Why is it important? Um, I think in 2021, um, as a collective community energy in the UK distributed um, close to half a million um, in fuel poverty grants in their local area and 70% of community benefit funds are spent locally so it is really that on the ground grassroots action which 
is really important. Um, and finally, because we get to see what's going on up and down the country, which is wonderful, I really, really love my job and I feel very lucky. Um, but we've noticed there are naturally areas in the country where community energy is thriving and there's, you know, the, the knock on impact of people seeing the concept, the vision, knowing about it, hearing it from their neighbours and it, you know, it growing. But then it tends to be in kind of Midland and Northern cities where there isn't as much community energy which for reasons which are, you know, understandable, you know, a lot of community energy tends to be in fields and, you know, a city centre doesn't quite fit with that. However, rooftop solar could thrive. So we're looking at this year, how can we help and ensure that there's no community left behind? How can we look at some of these cities and really try and help with the concept and vision? Because it's, our thinking is, well, it's all going to well removing barriers of funding and, um, you know time and capacity but if you don't even know community energy exists and you don't know the vision is there then you know how can we get to that point so that's something that we want to focus on for this year um, but but yeah I think in summary from us it's we, we obviously need more renewable energy I mean in 2022 I think there was only two wind turbines onshore wind turbines that were built um, in England which is just crazy because it's the cheapest form of energy so we want more renewables but crucially we want them to be community owned for all the reasons that I think we're on this call today so it's great to see uh co-op party and uh, the local power plant hopefully come into action and, and really make a difference um so yeah so hopefully that was helpful thanks very much Michaela and I think the point you made about the, the education how we get you know how we tell people about the benefits of community energy is, is super important it's something that you know we're very um aware of and I think you mentioned the the, the social impact of it the, the community benefit is is one way I think uh, to get people on board when they can see that happen um, in their local community changing the transformation it can make not just to, to them themselves or to their local community assets but actually much wider I feel um, it, it's, it's really good and I think also what you're saying about um, you know, we highlight some of the, the 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 most successful community energy projects up and down the country as a you know how do we get there? But it's also supporting those who are just starting out, and and because it can be quite daunting. Um, I think from for people we've spoken to, taking that on and and looking at best practice is wonderful. But knowing that that support is there from organisations like Unity is is I imagine and invaluable. So thank you very much for that contribution. Um, I'll now open it up to to questions. Um, as I said at the start, um, you can either uh, put your question in the chat and. Um, We'll, um, I'll be happy to read that out uh, to our, our panellists um, or if you want to uh, come um, and speak yourself just pop your hand up um, and like I say we've got about 20 minutes so I'm ha I'll, I'll take as many questions um, as, I, as I can. Um, so I've got Joe Joseph first. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, really interesting stuff. Really appreciated. Um, the problem we have in rural areas is that the national good is like wet string. So it doesn't matter if we can produce energy, we can't actually get it out from the rural areas or we can't connect to the grid at sufficient um, you know, power to be able to, to, to generate you know, economically. Um, I'd really welcome your thoughts, um, you know, McKenna and Alistair, on you know, how no community left behind includes rural communities in community power generation. Thank you. I'm happy to go first if um, yeah. if I'm not stepping on it. Yeah, but uh, a great a great phrase. I've not heard the wet string one before, but um, yeah, it sums it up nicely. But uh, I think yeah, there's multiple constraints um, to, to to the grid system. One one there's the physical infrastructure um, within local areas. Then there are the effectively the systems that regulate the access to that um, and the queuing systems and the authorization systems some of the uh, thresholds that operate there. So um, community energy organisations may struggle to influence those other than through, you know, political kind of processes. I think where they can help um, uh, manage some of the issues around oversupply into local grids is, is, is by identifying the opportunities to match local generation with local consumption and you know, those are relationships that can be unlocked by the kind of depth of um uh yeah depth of connections that community local community energy businesses can have with either local residents or local customers so i, th I think there is a landscape that isn't 
that far away from the universe that we currently live in, where you actually think about local supply in a different way. You could regulate the energy markets in a slightly different way that allowed that those connections to happen. All those things from an engineering perspective would be very, very, would make a lot of sense in terms of like using that energy locally and, um, and joining the dots between local generators and consumers. In that world, I think community energy adds masses of value. The way it's marketed at the moment, or the way it's regulated at the moment, is it's very centralised, and we we are kind of, I guess, like just lobbying, lobbying, um, uh, lobbying rather than lobbying, um, kind of, uh, you know, logic at that that system at the moment. Great, and I'll I'll just add to that. I think, yeah, you're right. I, I mean, England, the UK has got the the longest grid connection in Europe, which is obviously not good enough. I think there's been a few um, recent um, progresses with it. So there's been a bit of an amnesty with the transmission with, with when people apply for projects at the transmission level, they go in a queue and then people kind of sit on them and don't do anything. And then it clogs it up and people can't free up capacity. So there has been a bit of an amnesty um, process, which has um, freed up a bit of connection. I'd also say as well, in your local area, there is a, a heat grid, grid map so if you go on your DNO, your distribution network operator, quite often they have a heat map of, of you know, where there is a bit of capacity versus where there is not. But you are right, it's absolutely um, a problem. And I think given our kind of um, Octopus Energy, our uh, parent company of Unity, they've done a bit of a campaign of end the gridlock, they've called it. It's a five point plan and it's, you know, to enforce like sunset clauses, um, proactive queue jumping to projects actually further along, how can they get there? So there's a lot of, everyone recognises it's a huge issue. There's a lot of policy and um, things going forwards. And we're hoping, we work with one community energy group. They originally told they couldn't get connection until 2030, um, which is ridiculous, but they're hopefully gonna, they've appealed and hopefully they're gonna hear it here the next week if that can be brought forward to a year or two. Thanks for that, Joel. Um, I've got Paul White is next. Paul, if you wanna ask your question. Hi, yeah, thank a really, really fascinating talk. Um, I'm a councillor in uh, in London and um, we're trying to get, uh, we've only just taken control, and we're, we're trying to get um, energy, uh, cooperative energy off um, uh, off and running, but, uh, but struggling a bit. Um, and I was really interested in uh, Alistair's, um, two of Alistair's uh, projects because they spoke about um, uh, money um, and you said the first project was two million pounds was raised. Um, was that a loan, or was it, um, you know, uh, the 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 building would use the energy produced, and then any overproduction would be would be sold, so you can give the money back, or or is it just straightforward, you know, uh, money w without expecting anything back? And the other thing was the grants as well for your retrofit services. Um, are, are, are those grants only available to co-ops or, or are they available to local authorities as well? Um, so do, you know, co-ops have an advantage of getting hold of some grants that maybe local authorities don't? Yeah, good question. So um, so I think I referenced two million in terms of um, the, the first programmes of rooftop solar that we did. Um, so. So the two million was the community share um, capital that we raised to, in support of um, uh, that. Uh, no, so two million is the total community share capital that we've raised um, through the Community Benefit Society. Um, One million of that went to the rooftop projects um, that we ran. Um, the I think as a in terms of getting our community rooftop work off the ground some of the stuff that was really key for us was working very closely in partnership with Plymouth City Council so um, Plymouth City Council were the freehold owners to, to lots of um, uh, the buildings that were the community organizations and schools were hosted within um, and they had sort of right of veto therefore any kind of rent a, rent a roof scenarios that were being put to them at the time there'd been lots of rental roof scenarios that had been out there and the, some schools wanted to take them on but like the clauses in the leases weren't um the council weren't comfortable with so we were able to unlock that um by working directly with the council first and then going to then to the school say right you're a freehold owner <laughs> it's happy with these lease terms and then so 
that that arrangement with the council and the close working between PEC and the council really helped mobilise the rooftop programme. Then it also the council provided alongside the community shares that we raised, they put um, half a million in terms of long term debt to, into the company um, that allowed uh, that effectively first community share raise and the first programme to get underway. Um, and that was really important because it gave us capital to, to build the business and to build out those assets. It was really important as well in terms of raising community shares because it built confidence in our offer. You know, so when we went and, and marketed our community share offer, um, we were able to say local authorities done their due diligence on this sufficiently to release a, a, you know, a half a million pound loan to support this work. And um, that saw our community share first community share offer sell out in, in, in the first six weeks as a result. I mean, there were lots of things, but that local authority endorsement was very key. So that was just to the numbers. To the grants on um, around retrofit, so the, the grants that we are currently dispersing are grants that are available through various different government programmes under this, what is called the Sustainable Warmth Fund or the Home Upgrade Grants. Um, they, they changed their names, but we are currently working on the Home Upgrades Grant. We finished the Sustainable Warmth Fund last year. Uh, our role, so the money isn't available specific, specifically to co-ops, but what helps um, in terms of getting that money deployed into eligible households at pace is the fact as a co-op we're a trusted entity so you know we can say we are here we act on behalf of our members who are local you know we're a charitable and um, cooperative organization as well so um, we're able therefore through that I guess identity and trust unlock conversations with householders that just won't happen on a straight commercial basis. I come back in that parlor. Sorry, yeah, I just, I just want it, uh, so with the shares, you have to uh, basically you will pay back that uh, money uh, or potentially if, if somebody uh, asks for that to be repaid. So the community shares were raised. So we raised the community shares on the basis that people are putting, um, they put, put in between £50 and £100,000 into it. They were offered um, a return at a time of uh, 6%. Um, and uh, on the rooftops um, scenarios, we had to reduce the uh, returns to four, no, 5% because um, they, they didn't operate quite at the level, but it was still a good, good offer. Um, they members can extract their capital on a, on a basis of like one fifteenth a year um, across across the program. So people can't just pull the money out any time. The business effectively hold, holds that capital on behalf of the members and, and releases it. I mean, in late relation to that, if the business can afford to release it, it does. And we have we continue to pay our, those members back that have um, requested it. We have a lot of members that just want to keep the money in and, re and receive um the, the interest rate or the, the member return um and know that they're supporting an organization like us fab thank you very much thanks paul um i've got philip hey, philip i see you've got a question in the chat if you want to if you want to unmute and, and say it live that's okay with you. that should be you unmuted philip Not sure if Phil's maybe having a couple of um, audio issues uh, there. I can read out the, the question in the chat that Phil has put. It's, um, has there uh, been any progress on the local energy bill? Do you want to come in on that one? Okay, are you, are you following that one? I'm not the latest on it, so. Yes, um, yes, I don't, it didn't go through as it stands. I know they are working on new amendments and kind of re-looking at it. There was a few issues um, with it in the sense of to do some of the things that the bill wanted to do, you need to kind of totally change the underneath the, the regulatory and policy elements of the electricity market. So the electricity market is going through something called REMA at the moment, which is review of the energy market arrangements. And so some of those fundamental elements need to can be amended before anything like that could happen. So it's in a kind of almost like a brand new refresh looking at the, the local power plan. But also on top of that, you've also got um, a lot of, people advocating for locational marginal pricing as well which is a little bit different but again it's that kind of 
you know, locally focused. If there's any gener energy generated in a certain area, then certain, you know, then businesses and people should 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 benefit. So there's a, there's a lot of um, activity going on in that space. It's just working out, I guess, what what would fit. But yeah, so to summarise, it's going through a, a complete refresh at the moment. So they haven't yet released what that would look like. It's fair to say. I mean, uh, hats off to the the people behind that campaign because the political um space they've created off of what was quite a techie kind of thing to start off with i think is it is quite impressive and it has built quite a lot of consensus around the need for local supply even if the details of that hasn't quite been worked through i think the conversations at whitehall level now as a, around local supply are significantly accelerated as a result of that campaign which is a, a good thing um, for some of the reasons we touched on earlier thanks Paul, and hopefully you were able to to hear that, Philip. Um, next, I've got David. David, his hand up. Yes, good evening. Um, so I'm really interested in this because I did have actually supported a number of sort of community sort of cooperative projects to by investing money in it, and much of the same way as what Alice said discussed. And as I say it does really well, and you do get a sort of a, a sound return, particularly. Let's say a year or two back when interest rates were generally quite low so that worked out well both of me but the thought i've had is i bought sort of say solar panels for my house on my own and i wondered if the carps have ever thought about actually sort of bulk buying these or bulk buying sort of a say wind turbines and therefore being able to instead of me having an installation on my house as a single entity it could be part of a group project where perhaps over an area perhaps or 30 or 40 get installed much i'm quite interested in the idea of having a wind turbine but obviously buying one on my own and then installing it it's going to be a one-off project whereas having sort of several people involved then it becomes much more viable and you can bring the cost down I wonder what you thought about that uh, from, from from my perspective we, we've not done bulk buying of solar but i know a number of um uh, organizations that have um Tresoc that operate in totnes just up the road from from me bath and west have they've both done um bulk buying of solar kind of panels in one form or another and done that um to either be able to provide lower cost installs through the households or to reduce the total capex cost to like provide better offers to um commercial buildings so there have definitely been successes there in terms of those um, community um, organisations operating in that way. Um, the world of trying to join up um, uh, sort of installations across multiple um, households gets quite complicated um, because of um, they, they need to connect into a single meter. It's just a technical thing, but it's, it's a real thing. And so, like, if you could have um, a, a single installation running down a terrace, but it always got to go in through one meter or and yeah. And so that that limits the work or makes it difficult for all those households to benefit. Um, so again, minor changes to some of those kind of regulatory kind of regimes could unlock more of that kind of collective activity, co cooperative activity at a local sort of hyper-local level, but a bit difficult at the moment. Yeah. And just to add to that, a good example of kind of bulk buying on a residential street. Um, there's um, a really great group that have recently kind of come to fruition in Walthamstow in North London, um, and it's called, I think, Power Station. Um, and they've collected, they essentially did what you've just described, David. They did a, a bulk purchase of um, solar panels, went out on the street and said, who wants solar on their rooftop? So um, they then got one supplier to in, do the install, do everything. And then everyone had their own kind of, you know, remit. Um, so it wasn't that they all had to be connected, but it was just that street action, all getting together, collectively doing it, doing it in one go, uh, making lots of noise um, and, and doing the right thing. Well, that'd be really helpful. Okay, do you know okay, we've got a link to it, what, who they are, so I can look it yes. up for myself. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, thank you so much for that. Thank you for for that. Those uh, um, those answers. Um, I don't see any other hands, um, and I don't see any other questions, um, in the the chat. Um, so I'll I'll just say this probably as coming to the to the end. So I'll open the floor to the or our two guests just to get any last kind of. Uh, comments you want to make before we kind of wind up or anything like that uh no i think you know i think community energy is 
can be two things. I think it can be that that you know that street coming together, um, you know, on a voluntary basis to unlock projects. It's that thing, um, and there's a space for that. And I think we also need to think about it in the way that you know Peck has managed to evolve into large, influential kind of and successful community businesses. And hopefully, or well, I know hopefully organisations like us can nurture the others, but you know. Um, I think community energy is often referred to and understood to be, you know, as the voluntary bit, not regularly thought about as like, you know, successful um, uh, community businesses operating at scale, but they can be. And from my perspective, I guess it's just, it's, it's great to have so many people here engaged in community energy and want to learn more because that's what we need. We need people, it's people on the ground that are getting these projects going and do the social impact. So for me, it's just a real kind of, you know, hopefully this enthusiasm, you know, find out how you can get involved, take action. Um, and just a thank you to Cart Party for, you know, facilitating this space and seeing that it's needed um so very much you know welcoming the the local power plan thanks well and just as i say there's there's no more hands up a couple of hands pop up so i know we've got we've got a couple of, of minutes there so i'll i'll bring in Eta. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to say in response to Philip, um, so I work at Power for People and we are the people who campaigned for the local electricity bill. Um, so I just thought I'd say a few words where you're at the moment. Um, so yeah, at the end um, of last year, we had the announcement from the government about the Community Energy Fund for England. Um, and then also a consultation was announced about the barriers facing community energy groups around the UK. Um, so these processes are underway and were largely the result of the pressure that um, the local electricity bill had brought about in Parliament um, as the energy bill was progressing. Um, but yeah, we are currently um, in like planning stage for our next like policy move. Um, and this is also largely depending on the upcoming election. So yeah, we are sort of taking a restock of what our next move is. Um, yeah, and if, if anyone has any further questions, like please do get in touch with us. Um, but yeah, that's currently all, all really I have to say about that. But yeah, thank you. Thanks for that, Etta. And hopefully uh, if Philip was able to, to hear that as well, that um, update on the on the, how the bill is, is going. Um, so all that's kind of left for, for me to say is uh, thank you all for, for joining us today. Uh, do make sure you, you email or tweet or X as it is uh, now if you've uh, enjoyed the meeting. Um, a huge thanks to our, our guests, Michaela and Alistair. It's been a really interesting discussion. Um, and thank you all for, for your contributions um, and questions. Um, as you all know, we're now in a general election year. Um, it's keeping us all on our toes. Uh, so the Quota Party will be holding a large number of online events so you can learn more about uh, the things that we're campaigning on, how to get more involved in that campaigning, as well as introducing you to some of our uh, candidates. And we'll be emailing you um, in advance or you can find out more on the events page um, of our website. Uh, so just get involved in our campaign. Uh, I've put some links um, in my email again, just in case some people didn't uh, get it at the start of the, the meeting and were late in joining. So please do get in contact. Like I say, we've, we've got a, a full campaign pack on community energy we're really keen to support um, our branches and our members uh, to get more involved in that and if there's anything that we can do uh, please do do just uh, drop me a message and finally uh, do remember that the team at co-op party hq are here to for um, all our members so if it's not campaigns that uh, you want to get in contact with someone if it's if one of our other um, departments then please do uh, get in touch and we're more than happy uh, to help you so yeah huge thank you uh, to everyone who's joined us um, and, and keep safe and a huge thanks to Izzy for, for from the co-op team for, for facilitating this.